Hi, welcome back to Used Bike Reviews. I'm your host, Peter Monchizadeh. We live in the golden age of the high-performance motorcycle. You can go to, into any dealership today and buy a motorcycle straight off the showroom floor that has over 200 horsepower and has all the electronic aids you could possibly want. But let's take a look back just 10 years ago. Are bikes 10 years old really that far behind on technology? Well, I think this 2007 Kawasaki Ninja ZX-10R would like to have a word with you. Welcome to the second generation Kawasaki Ninja ZX-10R. When it was introduced back in 2006, it received sort of mixed reviews from all the critics, mainly due to its polarizing styling, its questionable chassis ergonomics, and its soft suspension. I think most of them were just thinking about the previous generation ZX-10R and trying to compare it directly to that. Well, this bike wasn't as track-driven as the previous version, but it was a much more easy-going road bike, something you'd actually want to own. Easy-going isn't the adjective that typically comes to mind when thinking of superbikes. The second-generation ZX-10R just happened to be a much less twitchy machine than its predecessor. However, it is certainly still a high-performance scalpel with a compact riding position. One positive aspect about this bike that everyone could agree on is that bomber of an engine that's nestled deep within these bright green fairings. 998 cc's of inline four fury, produced over 174 horsepower and 86 foot-pounds of torque. It led this bike to be the most powerful machine that 2007 had to offer. Or was it the most powerful? Do you think you'll remember 10 years from now what the most powerful superbike in 2016 was? We get caught up in the horsepower war between manufacturers that we begin to lose perspective on how much power a rider can actually utilize on a regular basis. I think it's safe to say that 170 horsepower is plenty adequate on two wheels, no matter what decade you're living in. When you throw a leg over one of these big ninjas from this era, you realize it feels a lot lighter than the size of machine it says it is. It weighs about 390 pounds, but it certainly doesn't feel like anything more than a 600. Also, you'll notice that the front brake lever requires a great amount of travel before you actually get to the braking. This is actually a common issue that many riders have reported. The only way to fix it is to just install a different master cylinder to give you more front brake feel. That isn't to say the brakes fitted to this bike can't make your eyeballs pop out of your head if the lever's given a hefty pull. They definitely can. The large front discs and monoblock four piston calipers are more than up to the task of stopping this powerful machine. With this bike, every negative trait is reversed with the positive. Just take a look at the factory fitted Olin steering damper. It's a welcome feature with such a powerful engine that constantly asks to loft the front end. One of the larger criticisms of this bike was the super soft suspension it was fitted with. I was surprised when I first got on it just how squishy the rear shock was. This one's actually been stiffened up all of the way and the ride height has actually been increased. But even so, you can tell how easy it is to squish the rear suspension. It's okay if you're the only person on the bike, but let's say you add a passenger, you lose a lot of ride height. The suspension has always been viewed as this bike's weak link. It is quite soft for a motorcycle in the leader bike category. But again, perhaps this bike was made with road use in mind. If the softer suspension can keep you in the saddle longer, then where's the hurt in that? If the track is your focus, suspension can always be modified to suit your liking with relative ease. If you are considering the track, then you'll be pleased to know that the ZX-10R comes standard with a lap timer and a slipper clutch that makes high-speed downshifting a breeze. That bit alone would be a costly aftermarket upgrade for many bikes of this era. The engine on this bike is a sweet unit with a tremendous amount of raw power on tap, but there isn't a lot of bark below 5000 RPM. The transmission shifts are quite good, the ratios are close, and I was never left with a false neutral. Due to the underseat exhaust pipe routing, the seat can get toasty after extended riding. The stock windscreen is very low and doesn't do much in the way of wind buffeting. However, the wide front bearing does do a good job of keeping cold headwinds off the hands. Aside from the relatively high foot pegs, the riding position is comfortable for a sport bike. When you're going out to look at one of these, pay attention to the right side of the fairings, right in this area. 
if you see anything like scratches or nicks or just general paint imperfections, it's actually a common issue. These bikes have a high kickstand, and if it's parked on anything but a flat surface, the wind can easily knock it over onto the right side. While you are looking the bike over, pay close attention to the water pump located on the left side of the bike. These are known to leak and will cost around $170. Kawasaki's aren't known for the corrosion resistant part finishes, so take note of exposed bolt heads, engine components, and suspension items. I advise staying away from bikes exhibiting any rust. The exhaust manifold and radiator are all located behind the front wheel and are not protected by any bodywork. Check these components carefully for damage or heavy corrosion. Check the ignition switch for excessive movement by gently moving it around. These are known to become loose and make annoying rattling noises while riding. As with any sport bike, check the fork seals for leakage. Leaked oil can contaminate brake pads as well as cause unpredictable suspension compression and rebound. A second hand ninja can be a great way to get into a used superbike. However, there's some things to watch out for. These are the sort of bikes that attract owners who like to add their own personal touches to them. Take this bike, for example. It's been fitted with a high quality aftermarket full titanium exhaust system, a billet aluminum adjustable rear set, silicone high performance hoses, steel braided brake lines. Now you take these things and you realize they're actually items that add to the performance of the motorcycle. It actually makes it a better bike than when it came out of the factory. Now you might also go look at a bike that has some strange graphics going on it. Maybe it's been repainted. Maybe it has LED glow lights going on or a cheap aftermarket exhaust that doesn't fit well. Now again, these are personal touches. But if you're going to put your money into a machine, you want to make sure you're getting the nicest one you can. If your bike might have some of these odd personal touches, just make sure you can reverse them and put them back how you want them to be before you hand over the dollars. Aftermarket additions, while costly to purchase initially, don't really add much to the value of a used machine. Don't make your purchase decision based solely on these items alone. Make sure the bike has a strong mechanical and cosmetic foundation as these aspects point to a caring previous owner. A new ZX-10R originally would have set you back around $11,000 in 2007. Today you can find a pristine example at half of that, averaging just over 10,000 miles on the clock. Hopefully I've been able to show you the bargain that is a 10 year old superbike. It may not have all of the newest electronic aids that something in the showroom today might have, but honestly, in the real world, do you actually need it? Well the answer is probably no. It still has all the horsepower you could possibly ever want, it still has great braking performance and great handling prowess. So why don't you save yourself a couple extra dollars and buy yourself something from this era.